Do you see a scenario where potentially, um, similar to the free banking era where uh, credit notes were issued against uh, gold, that we could have forms of money which are credits or notes issued against Bitcoin? I think so. Yeah, I think I think you could have a free banking system based on Bitcoin, in theory, and it would have advantages over gold in the sense that banks could have proof of reserves. That's the, that's the theme that Nick Carter yeah, brings yeah. up a lot. I think it's a good, it's a good one. Uh, and the fact that it's just inherently more uh, faster, right? That it, it kind of, it reduces the desire and the need to hold currencies that are backed by nothing that cost nothing to produce. And the only way to enforce those ends up being basically uh, force, essentially. That it, if, if you want to force people to hold a softer money, it takes some degree of, of coercion. But right now, it's not super needed because the trust level of these you know, cryptocurrencies as a whole, especially, uh, and then even Bitcoin. A lot of people can't differentiate between different different cryptos. They don't know how how Bitcoin's different than mm. Dogecoin or different than Luna. They, a lot of people just kind of put them all into one bucket. And I think that over time and knowledge, if you do get that large enough understanding and adoption of Bitcoin, it, it becomes harder and harder to maintain other types of money. I guess we essentially, when you wrap Bitcoin and you take another token as an asset against that Bitcoin, that is essentially a very similar scenario where you'll be issued something that can be redeemed for Bitcoin yes. in and out. And I know probably very similar to what US what happened with UST and Luna, except obviously that completely failed. Um, but that's an interesting scenario because I wonder if that's something that enables Bitcoin to to scale better. You yeah, you the short answer you need to incentivize that in some ways. Yeah. So for example, we have the liquid network where you give a Bitcoin, you peg it in and you get a liquid Bitcoin. And the advantage there, so the disadvantage, first of all, is that you're not directly holding Bitcoin anymore. Yep. Now you have a, an extra layer of trust built on top of your Bitcoin uh, that the Federation is not going to work against you. Uh, but what you get in, resp- in return is that you get faster Bitcoin, you get more expressive Bitcoin, and a little bit more private Bitcoin. Hmm. Right? So you're, you're agreeing to a set of trade-offs. And then there's other versions like, for example, Federated Chalming Mints, where they can make essentially an even more anonymous version of, of kind of like what Liquid's doing. I've seen I've seen people talking about this recently. I know Anita Posh has talked about this. Um, I think I saw Matt Adele talking about this. Do you want to explain what these federated mints are? So someone, someone with a degree in computer science could go way more <laughs> in detail, but essentially it goes back to the 1980s. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Chom, uh, they created blind signatures where you could essentially run what is basically a community bank where you can peg in something, let's call it, but that was pre-Bitcoin. It's kind of the initial e-cash. But if you were to apply it to Bitcoin, you can peg in a Bitcoin to a Chalming Mint and get a token that represents a Bitcoin or a, you know, a denomination for Bitcoin. You could have different bills, basically, uh, digital bills representing a certain amount of Bitcoin. And the cool part about it is that it's anonymous to both the creator of the Mint and to other users. Uh, the downside is you have to trust that the person running the Mint is either not going to be coerced or exit scam. It's, it's a centralizing force. And that, that's, I think, a big piece of why the initial creation of it back in the 80s and 90s didn't take off. But there are ways to reduce that. So, for example, if you had that built on a multi-sig and it was a federation, that becomes a somewhat more reasonable trust model. We have to assume that, say, the, the, the board of directors of this institution is not going to, the majority of them are not going to be corrupt or coerced to act against it. And so what you essentially have is these anonymous community banks that hold Bitcoin and that issue blind IOUs that are essentially more anonymous versions of Bitcoin, uh, but they go through that federated trust model. So it's kind of like a liquid with a, it's less auditable, but more private. Okay. And I guess with something like that, you could build, I don't know, small regional little economic uh, centers, a bit like what happened with Bitcoin Beach. Yeah. And you could use that. I mean, somebody could fund uh, a local project and have a distribution of you know, sub tokens for that from that mint and yes. help drive that economy. Yes. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, there's a whole, you can do fully centralized ones, you can do federated ones, you can do anonymous ones, you can do non anonymous ones. There's all sorts of models you can build using Bitcoin as a base layer similar to gold. And it just becomes a question of does Bitcoin become a large and stable enough asset base? those sorts of things to become sustainable. I kind of wonder what the impact is in terms of 
how how uh, the the central banks will break down, how what what how they would collapse and what the impact would be. Have, have you thought through that? Well, we kind of see in emerging markets okay. a model of how that works, where they get to a point where they have recession and high inflation at the same time. They have okay. stagflation, uh, and that's something that's been very rare for developed markets uh, in the past in, during this whole span of the system. So we saw it during World War II. Uh, we saw it during the 70s. Uh, that was the breakdown of the Bretton Woods. And then uh, we really haven't seen it since then. Uh, and so now we're seeing it kind of for the first time, cracks emerge in the developed uh, market central banks. And so I think the way that eventually breaks down is when you have high inflation, uh, but they can't raise rates to maintain it. And faith in that system deteriorates and the quantity keeps increasing. Like what's happening right now. <laughs> like what's happening now. But people are quick to jump to like the Weimar comparison, right? They're always, okay, yeah. they, they, they tend to go to the fastest thing. A couple of points about that. One is even in Weimar, you would think looking back at the chart, you'd think, well, the easiest thing to do is to hold gold and, you know, even, even lever your gold. The funny thing is, you know, when you zoom in on the micro, you know, German authorities weren't dumb. They weren't just letting this happen. They were, there were periods where they tried to fight back. They tried to strengthen their currency and they tried to rein this in. And so you'd have, for example, gold draw down 80% in German marks during hyperinflation uh, and then shoot up, you know, a million percent. Like basically, it was like this crazy sine wave that was breaking out. It kind of looked like a Bitcoin chart. Mm. Gold basically looked like Bitcoin in, in German marks during hyperinflation. Uh, so one is that even hyperinflations, when there's attempted pushbacks, they're not smooth. And two, that you can have much, much slower versions of that where, you know, Something like Weimar was a very specific case. You had a deindustrialized economy from the war. You had external liabilities uh, denominated things you can't print. Uh, Is that the reparations? Yeah, the reparations. Yeah. Uh, and so now you're in an environment where major developed central banks and governments and, and institutions in them, they owe debt denominated in their own currency, but their currency is slowly failing because it's no longer worth a certain amount of energy anymore. And the interest rates are no longer able to compensate for that high inflation. So I think this decade is going to be transformative, but we're still too early to say exactly where this ends up or how quickly this goes. Okay, so interesting. So if it looks like a Bitcoin chart, but is it really like the Bitcoin chart in reverse in that you've got uh, the Weimar Republic is a collapse of a currency and it's become increasingly more volatile. But actually, the Bitcoin chart is super volatile, but the volatility is dropping as it's, you know, essentially as we're, uh, recapitalizing the world on a on a new currency, are we, are we kind of seeing? Kind of yes. You that, see what I mean? In Weimar, you had the collapse of the mark to the gold. Yeah. Whereas now you have mostly the rise of Bitcoin, with a smaller collapse of the fiat currencies. Hmm. So in a world of no central banks, is inflation then purely down to growth in productivity and changes in economic environments? How do you think, what, what, is, is inflation just like a naturally occurring phenomenon? So I think in the long arc of time, deflation is, okay. is, is kind of the, the outcome because, so even in our current environment right now, let's say you have 3% inflation uh -huh. over a long period of time. If you look at the actual money supply, that might be 6% average money supply growth. Okay. And the question is, where is that other 3%, right? So if you have 3% inflation and money creation is actually 6%, it's really because there's a lot of innovation going to making prices cheaper on a regular basis. We can think of it in terms of TVs, computers, smartphones. So again, what Jeff Booth talks to us about. Yes. Yeah. So the underlying long-term arc is towards technological deflation. So things get cheaper over time, most things, um, uh, especially when compared to whatever the hardest money is. So things priced in gold tend to get cheaper over time because we find better and better ways to produce more of them. Um, but they tend to go up as priced in fiat currencies because we're making fiat currencies at a faster rate than that uh, uh, technological disinflation, deflation. And so if you had a hard money environment, whether it's gold, which has like a 2% inflation rate, or Bitcoin, which tends towards a 0% inflation rate, you would incline towards you know, low negative inflation. Yeah. If, uh, if you ever, ever kind of had that environment. And I guess also we have Bitcoin, which is lost, or we have the dust number, which can't be used. Like there's, 
even though it trends towards zero, the actual total supply, even if it's not been issued, is also, or total available supply is always shrinking as well. Huh. I do wonder though, like, I wonder if Bitcoin can support 8 billion people. That I don't, I haven't seen the evidence that it can. Now, I, I know some people have talked about uh, 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 sats being like micro sats, and, but I haven't spent enough time looking at that. Um, I'd be interested. Have you, have you considered that? I think, yeah, well, yes. I think the only way it works realistically is in layers. Okay. Which is how any financial system, any, any complex financial system is developed, right? So you have basically Bitcoin as the base layer, you have Lightning, and then you have different levels of custody on top of that. You could have things like Cash App, right? So it's Cash App can scale to tons of people, but of course you're trusting Cash App. You're, you're giving up some degree of the permissionless. Then you have those things like federated Chalmin Mint that can be a, a on the spectrum between self custody and, you know, third-party custody, you can have these kind of distributed custodies. So I think when you combine multiple layers and technologies together, people can kind of choose their own adventure on how far down the Bitcoin stack they uh -huh. want to go or what their economic reality allows them to go, right? So someone with a lot of Bitcoin might want to go deeper on the Bitcoin stack, whereas a lot of other people might want to rely on those federated custody services or fully custody, custody services or just have their own kind of lightning setup. Yeah, and if you have other scaling solutions like uh, uh, Liquid, there could be a variety of these. Yes. This is essentially the very similar to the free banking era, yes. but it's the free Bitcoin banking era, kind of. Yes. And different Bitcoin will have, like, I guess, different value. But I, I mean, I don't know if there is there a, is there a premium or a discount on liquid Bitcoin. I don't think there is. I think they trade one for one. I think so, yes. There would be, a, so in the free banking era, there was a discount based on the, one is how much you trusted the originator of that issuance. And then two, how far you were from it, how liquid it was. So for example, the Bank of Arkansas, let's call it. If you lived right near the Bank of Arkansas, it'd probably trade one-to-one -one, uh, because you know it's super liquid. It was if you're in New York, you're like, I don't want the Bank of Arkansas note. I'll, I'll buy that for 80 cents. Yeah, fuck Arkansas. Because I got to do all this friction to get it ever redeemed. Yeah. I have to get it to Arkansas. Um, and I don't really trust it, right? Yeah. So you'd have these different levels of, of pegs. We actually kind of see that today with USDC and Tether. Right. Well, so yeah. during the whole Luna fiasco, um, USDC, you know, their attestation so is 100% T bills and cash, whereas Tether has a portfolio model where they hold they hold some of those, but they also hold some assets that do have risk, and they also have that this longer track record of of people questioning their asset quality. And so you had more people want to redeem Tether. Tether is trading at a at a discount, whereas USDC was trading at either full or sometimes a premium. And so you have different levels of, of how the market assesses their risk and arbitrages that. So some people say, okay, you want to sell me tethers for 95 cents, I'll go ahead and redeem them for dollars. And so you have someone willing to step in and arbitrage that. So yeah, basically in an era uh, that is like that, including the one right now, if there are questions about liquidity or solvency, you get a discount compared to the underlying Bitcoin that it represents. It's fascinating. We're living in an era where we could genuinely see a transition to a completely new monetary system. Potentially. I mean, yeah. that, but if you look back in history, that happens on a, you know, not a, not a frequent basis, but it happens regularly. Money is a type of technology, essentially. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, you know, 13 years into this, we're still premature in terms of imagining the world 50, 100 years from now, right? Like, yeah. we can have these visions of what, what things happen. But I do think that cryptography has changed the and a global network. The combination of a global network with cryptography, with proof of work, with difficult adjustments has changed the game here in terms of what is possible with money. And Bitcoin is obviously the best version we know of on how to do that. So you can never really fast forward 20, 30 years and say this is what the world looks like. Uh, but I think that we've opened this Pandora's box mm. of kind of recreating the possibility of hard money, commodity money, but one that, unlike gold, moves at the speed of light.